Well, that was a rather noisy but fitting introduction to the subject of today's video. Exactly how does a dim bulb current limiter work? Now it all started from a question a friend of mine had when he saw my build of this dim bulb current limiter a few weeks ago. He wanted to know why this one, which has its bulbs in parallel, is that way rather than most of the ones he's seen, which are usually just a simple one or two bulbs in series. He wanted to know the difference between mine and this one. Now, this video is going to explain that, but first, I think it's a good idea to review and explain exactly how a dim bulb current limiter works. So, Let's start this examination by taking this version of the Tim Ball current limiter and breaking it down into its basic form, which would be this. Plug, a single lamp, and another plug. Now this can be broken down into an equivalent electrical circuit, which looks like this. Voltage source a resistor, and then another resistor, the first one being the dim bulb, and the second resistor being the device under test. Now it doesn't really matter, once we get it down to this electrical level, if we have two bulbs in series, two bulbs in parallel, or a more complicated system like mine with a bunch of bulbs in both series and parallel. They all break down to this simple equivalent circuit. Now I can even demonstrate this equivalent circuit quite simply where you have a resistor protecting the device with this circuit. Here I have a 12 volt current source, a resistor, and an LED. Here this resistor is protecting the LED from burning out. If I just had it direct connected directly, the LED would just flash and go off. Now, when I turn the LED on, like this, you just get a simple glow. Now, if a dim bulb current limiter is nothing more than a resistor in front of your device under test, why couldn't you just build a dim bulb current limiter out of resistors? Well, the answer is you can. But, when you get into mains voltage, the resistors you have to get are monsters like these. This one, for example, is 8 ohms and 350 watts. Cost between 50 and 100 dollars. And if I plug this into my system, I'd blow my breakers, because this draws 15 amps almost instantaneously. As even smaller ones like this one, which is only a hundred, which is only a hundred watts, still cost about twenty bucks. Even when you've got them built with the, the correct number of resistors, you still have to have some sort of indicator in here to tell you that your device under test is drawing too much power. Now compare that to this little guy here. This cost about thirty cents, and then the rig to hook it up cost about fifteen bucks worth of parts you can pick up at any hardware store as well. If things go south in your device under te test, this little puppy will glow brightly, so you can turn the power off right away. So now you know why the dim bulb current limiter has been around since your grandpa's day. There is minimal cost involved in building one, they're very easy to put together, and it indicates quite well when something goes south. It's the old story, you just can't argue with works cheap and simple. Well, as well as that, we can take advantage of another property of the little incandescent bulb. We can take advantage of the fact that an incandescent bulb is a non-omeric resistor, and I'll explain that directly. So a non-omeric resistor is just a fancy way of saying that this light bulb 
doesn't follow Ohm's law in the same way this resistor does. If I take this resistor and plot out amps versus volts on a chart like this, we'll get a simple chart where it's one amp, one volt, one volt, one amp, one volt, one amp, all the way up until it gets to the end of its voltage. If we do the same type of plot for a incandescent bulb, you get a curve much like this. At this end of the curve there's little or no resistance and as the bulb filament is warming up the resistance increases until it gets to the point here at its operating point where it will level out and stay at that amperage. Of course it's not a very realistic situation where you ramp up the voltage to device under test. Of course we do do it with a variac sometimes but under normal circumstances we just plug it in and instantly you go from 0 to 120 volts. Now if I was to plot that for this good old big 8 ohm resistor my plot would look like this. BAM! Instantly you'd be at 15 amps going into your device under test. Fortunately the same is not true for an incandescent light bulb. If I plot time versus amps, or amps versus time for this one, again you see a curve. Of course you have very high amperage when the curve, when the filament is cold, and as the filament warms the amperage drops down until it gets to its working point down here. Now how does that help us? Well, there is of course a spike at the beginning of both of these. This one's at 15 amps and of course this one is at I don't know how many amps this is. We can figure that out by using what is called the cold resistance of this light bulb. And we can figure that out by just using a simple multimeter. Ooh, so there's my multimeter. Bring that into the picture. If I just take a quick meter reading from this, you see we get about 26 ohms. And using a quick calculation with Ohm's law, I equals V divided by R, I, in this case 120 divided by 26, we get about 4.6 amps, which would be about here. We'll just call it 4.5 because that's what I have in my graph. Now compare that to the 15 amps on the same scale. I just have to zoom out to see the whole picture quite the difference in spike. So not only can we work out the startup amperage of 4.5 amps, we can also work out what the working voltage is. So I have my handy dandy slide rule here. We know this is a 40 watt bulb so we take the 120 volts, put it on 40 watts, And read off 40 watts on this scale, we get about 330 milliwatts. So down here the working amperage is 330 milliwatts. Likewise using my calculator here, I get about 360 ohms for the working resistance. So not only is a dim bulb simple, cheap, an indicating of a short, it also gives us a little bit of spike protection when compared to a straight flat resistor. So that kind of answers my first part of this video which is how a dim bulb current limiter works. Now we'll go over to the second part of the video and answer my friend's question why I use bulbs in parallel and not in series. So we're going to move over to a little test jig I came up with on the new bench and I'll see you there. So, here we are at the new bench, and anybody out there who had a good high school physics teacher, you might be familiar with this type of circuit. All we have is mains powers coming in, an on-off switch, two circuits in this present. On top we have a two bulbs in parallel, on the bottom two bulbs in series. Over here we've got our multimeter hooked in, where I can read the... Uh, output amperage and at this point I just have a dead short plugged in. So let's do a first test here 
of just a single bald in and see what we get for the amperage going out. Throw the switch and we get 331 milliamps. So good old Gregor was right. After 200, almost 200 years, this theory is still correct. So just for fun here, let's swap out the differing bulbs I happen to have handy here to see what the volt readings are in the voltmeter, uh, amp meter. So for this one, it's our little bitty 7 watt bulb. And you can see we're getting 54 milliamps. This is a 60 watt bulb, and we get about 440 something milliampers. Now it's a 100 watt bulb, and I get 760 milliampers. Finally, we got this big hunkin' one, I think 350, nope, 250, uh, 250 watts. Ugh. That's a beast. I'll throw that on. Ah, two amps! Okay. So that sucks up two amps of current. As the wattage goes up, the resistance goes down. So this lets in very little power. This lets in a lot of power. 2 amps versus 50 milliamps. Okay, in this simple demo, all we're going to do here is pretend that this light bulb, this 40 white light bulb, is our device under test. Now we know that wants to draw 300 milliampers maximum. And this is our dim bulb, which will let in about 0.5 of an ampere or 700 milliampers. So when I throw the switch, my bulb is happily drawing 300 milliampers, and my dim bulb is glowing lightly telling me that nothing's shorted. So this time around, let's just say, this pretend this is another 40 watt light bulb, not a 60 watt, and it's still, we don't want it to go over 300 milli 350 milliamps. And this is our dim bulb, which only lets in 333. So if I throw the switch, my dim bulb is glowing brightly, and that means I've got some sort of short over here. That's how it works. In this run, we've got our going to play with our parallel circuit. Here we have two 60 bulbs and then two 40 watt bulbs, and we're trying to start up a 100 watt bulb. So we know that that 100 watt bulb what wants about 0.7 of an amp where these ones give 0.5. So we know if we turn on our series bulb, we're going to get a bright glow there because this guy is drawing too much power for that bulb. As we see, it's drawing 0.4 of an amp. But we actually know we need more, so we're under power here. If I throw in my parallel switch, suddenly my power goes down to 2.5. And this one goes way down, and it almost goes out. Now, let's see what happens when I do the same thing in my parallel circuit. Just need to swap out my leads for the other circuit. Okay, so we'll start with our bulb in parallel, exactly the same result. But when I throw in my series bulb, and my parallel bulb, ah, we're letting one amp, half an amp go through. So that's the main difference. If I'm using my parallel circuit, adding bulbs in will increase the amount of amperage available to the device under test. And of course the exact opposite is true for bulbs in series. As I added more bulbs, the amperage goes down. So if I wanted to use that device with a two bulb tester here, I'd have to go do something like this, swap out a bulb, this swap out this bulb, or a great big hunkin' bulb like this. To 
turn her on and then I get my half an amp or 700, and 700 milliamps to actually run that lamp. So that's the main reason why I use a parallel versus series circuit. I don't like swapping bulbs out all the time and I'm able to add in more bulbs to give myself more power. Dim the lights so you can see this a little better. And what I want to show with this last experiment is that the dim bulb current limiter actually absorbs some of the shock when the power is turned on. Now in my top parallel circuit, I've got both my, I've got a 60 and a 40 watt bulb going into a 100 watt bulb. So that's a basically half an amp there and 700 milliliters draw. And you'll see when I turn it on, we're going to get a bright initial bright light here that'll glow down and then this will come on meaning the power is actually being absorbed by these before it gets into there and we're ready here we go so that you can see it actually buffers the power going in to a small extent now the effect is a little different when you have bulbs in series in this case rather than both of them glowing bright and then that going on what's going to happen is the lowest wattage this one is going to glow bright then the highest, the next highest wattage, then find the device under test. So you see this glow, that glow, then that glow. If I throw that on, there we go. And of course, it's kind of hard to say which one has the better protection for your circuit. There really isn't a lot to start there. But anyway, that's just an example of how that works. So that's it in a nutshell. I basically like my parallel circuit because it's much more flexible. I don't have to swap out bulbs. All I have to do is throw switches to add in and take out wattage. So that ends this video. Let's go see what Riley is up to. Riley, uh, what are you looking at, Riley? Is there valves or transistors over there? Riley? You're pretty intense, Riley. Must be a chipmunk. <laughs>